Researchers in the United Kingdom say they've made a major breakthrough in the fight against the coronavirus. According to a team at Oxford University, a widely available drug can reduce deaths among hospitalized patients by up to one-third. It's called dexamethasone. It's a steroid that is more commonly used to treat asthma and rheumatoid arthritis. The researchers gave more than 2,000 patients the drug for 10 days. After four weeks, they found the number of deaths among patients on ventilators fell by 35 percent. And for patients on oxygen, the number of deaths fell by 20 percent. For more on this, CBS News Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. John LaPook joins me now. Dr. LaPook, good to talk to you once again. Great what do you. we know about this drug? <laughs> what is typically prescribed? What is this drug typically prescribed for? And how exactly is it helping coronavirus patients? Elaine, it's so good to see you. It's been too long since I was in the same room. <laughs> I with you. know. <laughs> but, uh, That's right. You know, dexamethasone is a kind of a steroid like prednisone is, Medrol pack when people have allergic reactions. And the idea is that we're seeing with this virus that you have the virus attack you and um, it's attacking the lungs and that's doing some damage. But what's doing a tremendous amount of damage is the body's over exuberant response to the virus. It's almost like um, friendly fire where you're having, you've heard of this term cytokine storm. So the immune system goes to fight the virus and it tries to blow it up. But in blowing it up, it causes all, these inflama all this inflammatory response throughout the body, and you're seeing inflammation. You've, you've heard about it in the heart, in the kidneys. Uh, we're seeing it in the, in the liver, in blood vessels. So the idea was give, and there are a lot of other drugs that they're trying this with, give a medication that decreases that inflammatory response. Well, we've known about decades, and we, they're used in, in rheumatologic problems uh, when you want to dampen down the immune system. So this, when I, when I was seeing patients, um, you know, there were people in NYU Langone who, was, who were very, very sick. They were throwing the kitchen sink at them. And we didn't have these controlled studies to say, all right, we're going to take certain patients and we're going to give them this medicine, say steroids, and the other ones we're not going to give steroids. Well, now they did this study and they found that in the people who were intubated, who needed breathing tube, their mortality went from 40% down to 28%. You know, you, that's about a third that you said, but I think people need to know those numbers, 40% down to 28%. And if they needed just oxygen, it went from 25% to 20%. That's the 20%. If they didn't need that, if they were less sick, it didn't seem to make a difference. Hmm. So how does dexamethasone compare to remdesivir, another drug that has been used to treat COVID patients? Well, remember that in the remdesivir trial, we saw a decrease in the hospitalization stay of very sick patients from, I think it was 15 days down to 10 days. There was a little trend towards a decrease in mortality, but it did not reach what's called statistical significance, meaning it could have just, that drop could have been just from chance. Um, and it could be that there weren't enough patients and things like that. I actually, I got them for five minutes. One of the study authors today, I actually, through Liz Palmer, bless her soul, she got me on the phone yeah. with him. He was running from one place to another. And I asked him the key question, because it hadn't been published yet, which is, is this statistically significant? Yes, I know you have the drop in mortality, but is it statistically significant? And he said it was. It was very statistically significant. Now, I said, when are we going to see the paper? It's got to be peer reviewed. He goes, I know, I know, I know. He's hoping to do it like within a week, get it submitted, and maybe it'll get it fast tracked and we'll see it. But for now, I'm actually cautiously, maybe less than cautiously optimistic. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to see this kind of result. So to be clear, though, Dr. LaPoop, because a lot of people are going to really get their hopes up when they hear news like this, we are not talking about a drug that could be effective in treating all coronavirus patients. At least that's not what this particular research no, looked at, correct? That, that's such a good point, Elaine, and because most of the people um, have much milder disease. We're talking about the people who are very, very sick and they're in the hospital and they need either oxygen or they need a breathing tube. You know, that's where you put a tube down into the trachea to help to expand your lungs when and people are very, very sick. I mean, even a 28% mortality rate, remember it dropped from 40 to 28. 28% is nothing to celebrate if, if you just saw that number by itself, but when it, when it was 40% going down to 28%, that's progress. Let's put this in perspective, and I'm so glad you asked the question. Um, in terms of people jumping up and down and saying, now we have a cure 
for coronavirus. We do not have a cure for coronavirus. We have a treatment that seems possibly we need more data to be effective in people who are very, very sick. I'm putting an asterisk here. I'm not jumping up and down yet. I want to see the actual data. Um, but uh, this, this, at the end of the day, we need the vaccine. So that's the old expression. Remember, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. We need that ounce of prevention. And uh, we heard today from the uh, uh, people who were, who were talking on behalf of um, Project Warp Speed that there's a lot of progress being made uh, in getting these vaccines out. And they're doing it actually at risk, uh, meaning that instead of doing the normal three steps where you would say phase one and then we stop and we do phase two and then we stop and we do phase three and then we say, oh, it's successful, we're going to start manufacturing it. They're doing it everything at once. And it's costing a ton of money, but they're saying, look, if one of these many, many trials of vaccines work, we don't want to then be stopping and having to then make hundreds of millions of doses. So I think that's a, a smart strategy. And uh, Dr. LaPook, just so people have all the facts available to them, are there warnings associated with this drug, with dexamethasone? Every single drug that is pharmacologically active and can help is pharmacologically active and can hurt. So steroids do all sorts of things. For one thing, they can make you, um, your immune system is depressed. So if your immune system is depressed, you can get infections. That's one of the problems with them. It can cause, um, for, in long-term treatment, this is not long-term, this was, I think, 10 days or so, uh, it can you know, cause weakening of the bones and increase in blood sugar, diabetes, uh, stuff like that. One thing that was very interesting, I said to him, do you think other kinds of steroids will work? This is a little technical, but I think it's really worth saying because he, I, didn't, I didn't hear him say that in the, in the press conference. They chose it because it tended, one of the side effects of steroids is that it can make you retain fluid. Well, if you retain fluid, anybody who's ever taken steroids knows that you can get swollen legs and you can get swelling. Well, if you, if you retain fluids, it can go into your lungs. And if you have COVID-19, which is already attacking the lungs, the last thing you want is more fluid in the lungs so that uh, that can impede the transfer of oxygen from the air outside your body to inside. So they chose dexamethasone because it has decreased, uh, relatively low compared to other steroids, ability to cause retention of the fluid. And I loved hearing that from him because it was very, very thoughtful. Uh, it wasn't just, all right, we'll just try anything. This, is, this can be given as a pill or it can be given intravenously. And I said, do we know which worked best? And he said, we don't know yet. We got to analyze the data a little bit more. It's so important to outline what it is that we know for sure and what it is that we're still unclear about. Um, and on that front, I know the science is still very much evolving when it comes to this virus, what we're learning. But for people with uh, so-called milder cases of the virus that are not uh, requiring hospitalization, but perhaps may be feeling like maybe I should get ready to call uh, 911 and get myself to the hospital. You, what is recommended right now to treat their symptoms? What are some of the sort of red flags that might signal, hey, this is something that should no longer just be treated at home by myself? Right. Well, we know that like right now there's no medication that we know will help this group of people. You know, hydroxychloroquine was tried uh, in people who had been exposed to the virus and hadn't yet gotten sick, and that, that didn't seem to work. So right now, as you imply, you want to be aware of the symptoms. So we're seeing more and more of these symptoms. We used to say at the beginning it was cough and fever, and then if you had shortness of breath. Shortness of breath is still a very big symptom um, because uh, as the virus goes down into the lungs and starts to attack the lungs, you have decreased ability to actually get oxygen into your body. So anything that reminds you of like, I'm having trouble breathing, you definitely have to contact your, your health professional. Uh, you, don't wanna you still don't wanna just show up in the hospital uh, if possible. You wanna give them a warning. So call the hospital, call your doctor so that they're waiting for you. Or if you don't have a doctor, you can call the Department of Health or you can call the hospital um, so that they're waiting for you and they can protect you and they can protect other people when you come in. Um, I always tell my, you know, I'm, I've seen a bunch of patients with COVID-19 now, and one of the things that I found to be very valuable is we're learning about all these new symptoms, right? Chills and fever and aches and pains and uh, loss of taste. Um, but when should you actually get worried when you're at home if they're saying, well, usually it's kind of mild, you can do, you can just get over it at home. If you have the shortness of breath, but also if just trust your belly, if you're th thinking, I'm just not heading in the right direction. 
I'm just not heading in the right direction. Remember with fever, you get dehydrated, you can get dizzy, maybe you have trouble keep keeping up with the fluids at home. So I would tell people to trust your belly. Don't be sitting home at home and saying, um, well, I don't wanna bother anybody. Uh, if you're feeling fine, if you're getting better, you're improving every day, that's fine. But always keep in touch with your health provider. I know there are a lot of people who don't have health providers. That's something we have to fix in this hospital, uh, fix in this country. But um, otherwise, if you have any problem, any kind of sense that you're heading in the wrong direction, go to the hospital. But if you can, give them some warning be beforehand. And before we let you go, I do want to ask you about antibodies. So experts from Stanford and UC San Francisco found only a small portion of COVID-19 survivors have a super strength antibody. What are super antibodies and how are <laughs> researchers hoping to use them? Right. So you've heard about this, you know, this antibody response. So you get attacked by the virus and then your immune system makes antibodies. But not all antibodies are created equal. And there are some antibodies that you get but they're not really what's called neutralizing antibodies. The antibodies you want are neutralizing antibodies because they are specifically directed to that part of the virus, which is usually the, the uh, spike. We've heard about, we've all seen these spikes coming up. That's how it gets its name, coronavirus, because it's, it's shaped like a crown. Well, these antibodies specifically attack that um, spike and they stop the virus from attaching to uh, the body because it's through that spike that it attaches to these receptors in the lungs and probably receptors elsewhere in the body, like in the mucous membranes of the nose and, and elsewhere. So um, these people who have the neutralizing antibodies, those are the ones you want because they're not just antibodies floating around uh, attacking or attaching to a part of the virus that's not important. They're attaching to a part of the virus that actually will prevent it from attacking somebody, binding to somebody, entering somebody's cells and doing the harm that it's going to do. So uh, we're looking for those people who have all those antibodies, and we're taking their their um, serum, and we're giving, as you know, the, these plasma antibody studies that we're giving, and we're hopeful that they can help. But people should know, you know, the immune system is not just the antibodies. There are these things called T cells. You've heard about them with AIDS, of course. People have low T cells, low T4. Well, T cells, T4, T8, all sorts of other cells, macrophages. It's not the immune system is not just antibodies. So we're still trying to measure those other cells right now. There are very sophisticated tests going on to see when somebody is the million dollar question you're implying is if somebody gets infected, are they protected against getting reinfected? It's not going to be just the antibodies. It's going to be your cellular immune system, the T cells, other things. Um, and we know with the coronavirus, there are four strains of coronavirus that cause the common cold. And there was a study that somebody I spoke to at, at Columbia did where he found that um, people could get reinfected with that same coronavirus in the same year. So huh. some coronaviruses were huh. afraid that the immunity may be short-lived. Other things like SARS back in 2003, people had antibodies for up to two, three years. Of course, we didn't re-challenge them with SARS because that would have been unethical. We could possibly right. reinfect them and kill them. So there are a lot of questions about this, about who's immune, what happens? Everybody wants to know that. I've had, if you've had COVID, am I protected from further COVID? We don't know the answer to that. These antibodies, if you give somebody uh, the neutralizing antibodies, the super antibodies you talk about, is that going to protect them? We're not sure. And the vaccine, the billion dollar question, if you make the vaccine against this spike protein and you just have antibodies to it, uh, will that protect you? Or is giving the vaccine to the spike protein that has that, you know, that directs, it's like a bloodhound, right? You say, here's the spike protein. Now, uh -huh. you say that to the immune system, go after it. It might be going after it with antibodies. It may be going after it with the cellular immunity that I talked about. So a lot of questions, but I'll tell you something, Elaine, uh -huh. I have never, this month or last month, I was a doctor for 40 years. I had my anniversary. In all those years, ah. including being an intern during when AIDS hit for the first time, I have never seen the entire world, all of these scientists going after one problem. And the amount of research, the amount of cooperation is stunning and very exciting. But another asterisk for it is you still have to have the FDA. You still have to make sure that things are safe and effective. And all this flood of, of publications that are coming out, which none of us can keep up with, it's like drinking from a fire hydrant. Many of them are not peer reviewed. And so you have to say, mm. okay, it's information, but can I believe it? So to get back to the study with the dexamethasone, 
I'm very excited about it. I can't wait to see the more results. Um, but I'm still putting a little asterisk up there saying, I want to wait and see. Cautiously optimistic. All right. Dr. John LaPook, John, so wonderful to see you again. Grateful for your expertise, as always. Thank you so much and take care. All right. Take care, Elaine. See you soon, I hope. I hope so, too.